Welcome to Speaking to Speakers, the podcast that brings together business leaders, coaches, keynote presenters, actors, voiceover talent, and anyone else who uses words in their voice to make their living. I'm Robert Matson. Let's hear what they have to say. Welcome to Speaking to Speakers. Today I am uh, on location at uh, Davis Advertising in Worcester, Massachusetts, and I'm fortunate enough today to have Garrison Feldman. Yeah, hey, Garrison, how are you doing? I'm oh, doing well, Robert. Thank you for having me. Could you give me a little bit of background on Davis and what you guys do here? Well, so Davis Advertising is really, when they say full service, they mean full service. Everything from whatever content you might need, whether it be print, audio, video, something for the internet, something for not the internet, the media buying, all the account services you could need, everything is done here. And it's kind of neat. It's unbelievable some of the things that some of the people in this company could do. I mean, we have a published illustrator in our art department who's one of our art directors and just phenomenal things come out of there. And it's kind of nice because here we are in little Worcester, Massachusetts mm -hmm. and, you know, nobody ever expects something like that to come out of Worcester. But then you see the visuals on the side of the highway and you go, oh, wow, you made that. Wow, you guys made that. That's, uh, that's, that's really what, impressive. I was walking in and I see the the photos of Isaiah Thomas and Jason Tatum from the Celtics and and commercials that I've seen and uh, being a Celtics fan and I've been very impressed with and then I find out that now I know the people who did it. So yeah, that's kind of neat. And even around town, I, we one of our clients is the Worcester Railers, who's the semi pro hockey team around mm -hmm, here, sure. and we do a lot of their visuals, we do their radio content and all that stuff. I actually part time I, I work at the radio station and. I make sure their games are on the air sometimes, which is kind of funny how it all circles back. But speaking of storytelling, but, you know, I'll be driving to work and there's a Pepsi delivery truck on the side of the road. And the guy drops the, the back of the truck down and there it is, the big Worcester Railers logo that we created. And it's just really kind of cool to see that. <laughs> in fact, we are in Garrison's office and it's the first office I've ever been in. That has probably four feet of acoustic treatment all around the office. So this is probably going to be the best sounding podcast that I've ever recorded on location. Well, yeah, it's not, it's not too shabby in here. We take good care. I, I do a lot of the voice work in here as well. So when we have clients that either they don't want to spend for an out-of-house voice or they prefer the in-house voice, this is where it gets done. Absolutely. So Garrison, for lack of a better term, you're, you're a multimedia guy, uh, production engineer, writer, voiceover talent as well. And you're kind of a one-man army of talent. So when people ask you at a party, what do you do and how you got there, what the hell do you say? I laugh. <laughs> I laugh. No, I, I, it's very difficult to describe sometimes what I do to somebody who isn't very familiar with the industry, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Because I, when I started out of college, I moved to Los Angeles thinking that's where I had to go and was doing everything from PA work to casting to location scouting acting, writing, directing, whatever the hell I could get my hands on, that's what I would do. And so now that I'm here, it's kind of nice because they hired me strictly originally as an audio engineer. Mm -hmm. They kind of wanted to see what else can I do? And they've really given me the freedom to explore and use a lot more of the tools that I have picked up, refine a lot of the tools that I have picked up to kind of make myself into, I guess what you would say, uh, Hmm. If I if I had to try to define the position in one title, I couldn't. Right now, we're, we're pretty much using audio video engineer or audio video creative because that encompasses more of it. Mm -hmm. But all I uh, I've done research here. I've done all sorts of stuff that really isn't even related to the storytelling aspect. So it's. Kind of neat. I don't really know how to describe exactly okay, what I so do at a party. I'm going to tie Pretty you down. Bad. I'm going to tie you down to audio visual engineer, but let's take the engineer off because that's a little too technical. And Agreed. I and I use the term creative because I have I have many friends who don't call me a designer. I'm a creative, that's and uh, well, they don't want to be caught. I'm not just the person that's on the computer doing you know this color that color. They actually are making sure that things work from beginning to end from the creative yeah, they process. Conceptualize the entire process. Absolutely. From beginning to end. But so let's tie into audio and visual. So you work both in audio and visual. Uh, what's the difference in storytelling between those two? Oh, tremendous. I mean, visual, everybody is so visual, right? It's one of our most powerful memory cues. And 
people tend to associate storytelling with visual. So it's a little bit easier in that sense, I suppose. And the biggest difference is in audio, it you really do, unless you're singing a song, people are going to tune out very quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, as soon as a commercial comes on the radio, you change your dial, right? Often. Yeah, no, a lot of people do. So how do I make sure they don't change their dial? Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult with simply audio cues because right now you're only appealing to one of their senses. Whereas when you do something that's visual, yes, you're only appealing to technically that visual sense as well. But with the visual aids, you can really get other people or sorry, people's other senses working at a different level. When you bring out a plate of steaming hot food on video, for instance, mm-hmm. you can almost smell that food. You can almost taste that food. Can't really do that on radio as effectively. It's a lot more difficult. It's very nuanced than if you jam something full of sound effects, it's just going to sound convoluted. So I think the biggest difference is it's really, really difficult to capture people with the limited scope that you have in just an audio medium. So would you say you have to be a better storyteller if you're doing just audio because you're losing so much of that information? Yes and no. I uh, I think it's a different skill set in a lot of ways. I think that, you know, when you're writing something down, let, let's break it down into three buckets. You have your written story, your visual story, and your audio story. When you're writing it down, it's very easy to see everything from top to bottom. You can go back and, you know, okay, this didn't work with this. And you can make sure you have a clear beginning, middle, and end. You can make sure that you have a clear structure and a clear path that you're going. With the video, that becomes a little bit more difficult because it's not all right there on the page. You have to go back through the footage. You have to make sure you're getting enough footage and enough coverage when you're telling a video story so that, you know, you don't leave any gaps behind. But even so, when you're editing that video story, you look back and there it is visually right in front of you. So you can make sure there's a nice beginning, middle, and end, and it flows very nicely visually. With audio, you don't really get that luxury. Of course, you can listen and hear the beginning, middle, and end. But is the listener going to hear that clear beginning, middle, and end? Yeah, there's so much work that gets put into telling the multi-threaded story that oftentimes you're like, okay, one in ten people are going to hear this. Exactly. It it's so much more nuanced, so it it's more difficult in a way, but it's also more simplistic in another way because you really do have to be. There has to be a certain level of simplicity, especially when it comes to commercials and advertising with audio, mm-hmm. because if you don't have that simplicity, it's just going to drive people away very quickly. So and that's amazing. As you were explaining that, what went through my mind immediately was the difference between the single threaded nature of audio versus potentially the multi-threaded nature of video. You can split screen. You can quad screen. You could actually put a lot of different things on there. You have a depth of background to foreground, which is much more clear in a video, even though you do have background to foreground, if you think of the old uh, radio stories. Of course. So, and, you, and even some of the podcasts, the narrative podcasts that happened today, which absolutely. really cool. I love that concept. But it is much different. You could not make the movie crash mm-hmm. as effectively in an audio form because you can't cut back and forth from those stories and expect the listener to be able to comprehend like the viewer would be able to comprehend with the movie that you are suddenly changing as fast as you are. You definitely have certain constraints that are really hard to work around in audio. It's not that it can't be done, but you know, if you're trying to tell five people stories at the same time, it's difficult as all hell on video. How do you think it's going to be on audio? And there's the cutaway. So the cutaway in video versus the cutaway in audio. The cutaway in video is accepted and easy, I think, in contrast to audio. You actually have to make, and now we go to almost in audio, and the cutaway in video, you just go. Suddenly it's another scene. And I think that gives you more flexibility. So, And that's also the challenge. There's so many options, especially in video, that you can do. We were just having a conversation with one of your amazingly talented editors, and he was showcasing some of the things that he did, and all the thought that he went through in constructing from the audio level all the way up to the video. And it was fascinating how that went about. Well, and and they do. They are very interlinked in that way. If you make a video and there is an audio component to it, you need to make sure that audio component is not, I don't even want to say matches the video. I want to say is synchronized with the video. You Mm -hmm. want to make sure that the beats 
come in where the beats are supposed to come in and accentuate the correct things in either the voiceover or in the video that you want to see. And otherwise, it just it, it's very jumbled. Mm-hmm. It gets very jumbled very quickly. And I've, I've seen some sound design that's... Uh, we, we went to an independent film festival, actually, not too long ago. I, I had a short film that made the rounds. Oh, congratulations. Thanks. Nice. That was a blast. We'd, we'd like to do a feature next. That's, that's the next train. But there was one of them visually absolutely stunning. Whoever made this movie is clearly one hell of a graphic artist. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of the animation was just, it was extremely high level, something you would see in a movie like Avatar. Wow. But the story and the audio did not match the visual at all. And it was really hard to follow what they were trying to say. And at the end, they gave their big, you know, wash tagline in a short <laughs> film. And we all kind of looked at each other and went, that was really pretty, but what did we just watch? Hmm. And that's what you get if they don't match. No, it's a, it's a very valid point that it all has to serve the story. Absolutely. And we were just, in fact, in that conversation, we were talking about sometimes clients come, hey, remember um, remember that the uh, bullet time and the matrix, can you do that? And they say, oh, we want an effect versus a story. Exactly. It's <laughs> There's one of the speakers at the conference we met at last week made a nice reference to uh, the underpants gnomes in South Park, which I, <laughs> I thought was really funny. But they they do the same thing when there's there's an episode, I believe it's the Imagination Land episode, where they're they're trying to figure out a story arc so that they can stop the terrorists that are attacking our imagination, which is <laughs> a ridiculously hilarious concept. And they're pulling in all these directors, and the first one they pull in Michael Bay. He says, <laughs> Well, first you got a, a big CGI meteor over here. Whoosh, <laughs> shit, drug, whoosh. Those aren't ideas. Those are special effects. I don't know the difference. We know you don't. <laughs> and they bring in M. Night Shyamalan. And he says, well, what if they're not terrorists, but they're <laughs> werewolves from the future? And they say, that's not an idea. That's a twist. And they're right, because so many people in both filmmaking and television these days rely so much more on the shock value and the technology than they do the actual storytelling. Yeah, I hear you. It's a very interesting phenomenon, and it's it's something that I think, especially in the advertising world, you can't lose sight of because we only have so long to capture people's attention, and they don't want their attention captured. Oh, absolutely. They don't want to be pitched to. Nobody likes to be sold a bunch of stuff. You like walking down the street and everybody, hey, here, buy this. Hey, here, buy that. No, nobody wants that. But somehow we have to be able to figure out a way to communicate to them in a way that is effective and that they're going to be able to relate with. That is a great point. So let's let's dig into visual storytelling for a moment. Uh, So using a commercial, because it's something everyone's familiar with, what should people want and think about when they make a commercial or YouTube video or even a film? What should they think about first? Well, first and foremost... Anytime you're making anything, whether it be a commercial, whether it be fictional, I don't care what it is, what are you trying to say? What is your underlying message? And a lot of people say, well, I want to say this and this and this and this. No, 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 no. Narrow it down. Mm. Pick a strong underlying message. You can have sub-messages depending on how long your content might be and what you're trying to say. But you need to have one major focus to start off. And then from there... You look at the audience and say, okay, now how do I connect with the audience? How do I connect this major focus to the audience? What what would be relatable to them? And in terms of video advertising, that's become huge nowadays because commercials, I mean, I feel like we're a bit past the days of most of the, it's my money and I need it now. (laughs) We're we're past most of that now Mm -hmm. because, well, people got sick of it. People remembered it, but did it really increase their bottom line in the long run initially? Yes. Now? People are finding that advertisements that connect on a deeper level with the consumer are more important. For instance, during the Super Bowl, one of my favorites, I didn't even know this was an ad. I didn't care that it was an ad. I don't know if you saw the one where Anthony Lynn, the coach of the Chargers, was talking to a bunch of firefighters and first responders and telling them a story about how he, A, really appreciates what they do, but B, you know, he had his life saved and so he just... They're so dear to his heart and this and that. And then all of a sudden he turns around and who's there? 
the first responders from his car accident. And it was one of the most beautiful moments. And I'm thinking, man, that that's really cool. I thought this was an NFL commercial. And it wasn't. But Verizon struck a chord there. They did. It was yeah. smart. And I'll never forget that it was Verizon that did that. Mm -hmm. It did not make me go out and get Verizon. I mean, quite frankly, it, you, you get whatever services in your area. But I remember those things because I connect with them. A lot of the people, the, the Bud Light commercials with the Game of Thrones theme they have going on, mm -hmm. smart because people connect to that. And that's a great point because those old style commercials are all about attention. Mm -hmm. And newer commercials, they've evolved to connection. Let me connect you with the brand. Let me, let me show you that we're smart, that we're the type of people you want to be connected with at our brand because we're smart enough to make this type of commercial or pull that particular heartstring. Well, if it's not an iPhone, it's not an iPhone, right? <laughs> True. It's it's funny. They they really do. They try to use the these devices to connect with people that they didn't use often before. And some of them work, some of them don't, but it's been very interesting to see how the commercial world has evolved in that way. So connection is a thing that people should grab hold of first. And Absolutely. I think you've already touched on my next question, which is more about what should people avoid? And it sounds like that Michael Bay approach, getting caught with uh, you know, some kind of technique or particular visual that doesn't serve the story. Would that be the first thing? Or is there something even more important that people do that they shouldn't? No, I, I think that that's probably very high up there on the list. I mean, another one from the Super Bowl, the, the Planters commercial, where the Peanuts just driving the car. It's a chase scene, we think, but there's nobody chasing him. And he passes by Charlie Sheen, who says, and they think, I'm nuts. And it's it makes no sense. It's just mm -hmm. a bunch of bing, bang, wash. Here we go. Special effects. And now the nuts are on the table instead of the kale chips. And Alex Rodriguez is happy. What? What just happened? So I think that is absolutely one of the most important things is if you don't have a structure and you're just throwing together cinematic elements one after another, it looks cool, but unless you're a film geek, you don't care. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is absolutely one of the first things to consider. The other thing I would absolutely consider an absolutely no-no, just don't do it, unless it's your arena, stay the hell out of politics, man. <laughs> Holy moly. Holy moly. I mean, some companies it ended up working out okay for. Some, not so much. And it's just one of those arenas that is just so vile these days. And I think you could you could actually elevate that to charged topics. Yeah. Where people, they are zealot. They, it's a religious topic Absolutely. of some kind. You, you, you don't want to touch those because... because yeah, no, because man, no, how brilliant you are. If you're on the, the different side of someone who's listening... It doesn't matter how good you are because they are so focused on what they believe versus listening to your story. It Correct. probably is they're now effective. alienated. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly. that's not what you want. It, as an advertiser, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, as a musician, whatever it is you do, your goal is not to alienate anybody. Your goal is not necessarily to include everybody because once you do that, your audience is too big and you're not going to have a cohesive message behind your story. But you certainly aren't trying to alienate. I mean, especially, I, do people from religions try to alienate other people or do they try to get them to come to their church mm, and sure. come to their belief? Yeah. So to make the analogy right there, it's interesting. You don't, you don't want to alienate. Absolutely. Now, you do very professional work here. I've seen some on major network television. Thanks. And, I, you know, I don't and know it's again. beautiful stuff. And when people <laughs> see beautiful things, they immediately think, uh, I can't do that. It's way too expensive. I can't afford that type of stuff. So how hard is it to get professional work done? And for the people out there that might be on a budget, you know, what should they focus on for video production? How could they get it done, whether they need to simplify it if they're going to come to a pro like you? Or if they want to do something on their own, how do they get started? Well, first thing you do, sit down and whatever it is you're trying to do, again, whether it's video, print or audio, what message are you trying to get out? That's the first thing you have to do is you have to hash out your advertising plan, so to speak. Because that's also going to save time if you're focused when you come to someone to implement your concept, correct? Correct. And then it, it doesn't hurt to talk to people. I'm not saying go out and find your nearest, most expensive ad agency. I'm saying go find somebody you can talk to. I don't I don't care 
what ad agency they work at. I don't care if they don't work at an ad agency. If you respect the work that they do, go talk to them. Ask them questions. People in our industry, we love to chat and we love to share knowledge. And in the end, that's how we get most of our work. So I definitely recommend talking to somebody who is a little more versed in the strategy of the implementation once you have your message and you're, you think you're ready with your message, you run that message across people, make sure that message is effective, and then, then comes the strategy. And that's sometimes people have all that knowledge and they just kick ass at marketing and they go out there and they're a one-man band and they do the whole business on their own. But more often than not, that's not the case. So start the conversation. Definitely bring your idea to other people. See how it resonates. And then when it comes time for the strategy, if you're not sure where to go, that's when you find somebody because it gets a little bit more confusing when you're talking about placing your advertisements in the correct areas. That's not one of those things everybody can just automatically do. That requires a little more knowledge and a little bit more of a specific skill set in a lot of ways. Sometimes you can just get lucky. You pop up a YouTube video, it goes viral, and there you go. But not everybody has that viral energy, so to speak. So I think if if you're struggling and you're not sure exactly where to go, make sure you have a cohesive story. What do you want to say? How do you want to brand yourself or your company or your brand or your product? How what you know, what pain points does it solve for the consumer? What do you highlight about it? What those those major talking points that you would see on the headline of a website are often good places to start. But always focus on your customer first when you're doing these. Always focus on the audience, not just the customer, I should say. But always make sure that your audience is focused because if you were just sitting there telling your story, they're going to get bored. They want to know now. It's nice to know your story, but they also want to know how you can help them with their story. That's the average consumer these days. So it sounds like just knowing what you want, having a good, clear understanding of what you're shooting for, who your customer is, what the story you're going to tell, and then bringing that to someone to bounce off that's in the field that can maybe tell you what's possible and what's not. Correct. And then, and if you are having trouble segmenting that and breaking it down, that's, say, for instance, you know, you, you have a new product and it's selling well and it's it's good your marketing message is kind of generic and you want to switch it up, but you're not really sure how. That's also when you find somebody. That's when you go to a, a place that's more full service, a place that can help you with the creative, a place that can help you with the video, a place that can help you with every aspect of it, including the strategy and the placement. So there's depends on what level you're at, but there's always somebody out there that can help you do what you do, no matter where you are. All areas of this country, I, I can't think of any that are completely devoid of talented advertising creatives or talented audio-video creatives that can help you do what you do. So we are sitting here, and, and we're both, we've, we've talked about gear nerds, and we're both a bit of a gear nerd. And we're going to go back to your audio engineering background. So what advice would you give to someone out there that wanted to start their own recording, whether they want to do a podcast or they wanted to do recording for something for a commercial. Maybe they're a small business. And they're saying, you know, we want to do something. Can they get started on their own and just find some gear? And what would you recommend they pick up first so they could do something that is reasonably professional? Oh, of course they can. And I would recommend, of course, you, you don't just want to go grab the $15 karaoke microphone off the <laughs> shelves at Target and start walking around and interviewing people. That's you can do that when you're five or six years old. That's adorable. But if you're trying to actually do this professionally, you do need to get. Because there are actually interview the mics equipment. that are made for interviews to do that kind of handheld back and forth. Correct. And that's there's a lot of very inexpensive stuff out there that is very good. Um, look, depending on your budget, if you have thousands of dollars and you want to go buy a Newman, everything is going to sound great. That's the truth. But... How many people have thousands of dollars to just go buy a Newman? <laughs> not too many. Not, yeah, not unless you're probably a studio or a very big company. Exactly. I was I was talking to somebody actually at a studio in Atlanta, and they were telling me that they just outfitted everything with Newmans, and I'm thinking, oh, boy. Oh, that's nice. 
But yeah, those things are crazy expensive. So, you know, take a step back and realize that you don't need the best of the best equipment in the audio world mm -hmm. to get started. What you need is the knowledge and the to do things correctly. What If you don't record the audio right, I don't give a damn what you're using. It's not going to work. So skill before gear. Absolutely. You have mm -hmm. to, there's certain things you have to know when you're recording audio. I mean, when we go out on a shoot, the first thing I do is tell everybody, you know, shut up. No, I don't tell them shut up. I tell them, you know, give me eight to 10 seconds of silence so that I can make sure I get a good noise print and cut out all that background noise so that we can get a much crisper interview or some of the background noise if we want it to feel ambient, you know, mm -hmm. either way. But learn some of those things. Understand how your recording device works. Go out, test it, play with it. I uh, Both your microphones and the audio interface unit, I definitely recommend, especially if you're starting out, don't get a big old hunk in one for your computer yet. Make sure this is something that's going to work for you. The Tascams, the Zooms, the little handheld audio units, those things are beasts. Mm -hmm. I, they're so high powered. I picked up, I have personally, I have a Zoom H4n. I've had it for 11 years now. I can still go into a just grungy, dirty, small, acoustically horrifying bar and record a metal band and still be able to discern what's happening. These mm. things are really good. And a lot of them have onboarding mics that are, or onboard mics that are actually pretty solid. And, you know, once you get a mic or two, you can actually record in four channel stereo if you know how to disperse your sound correctly they're they're awesome so i highly recommend look into those they're not too expensive you can set yourself up especially for a podcast mm -hmm. you shouldn't have to spend hundreds of dollars to get yourself set up to do it if you already have a computer if you don't well then you know but there's programs out there that are free and awesome you don't have to spend the money on the programs these days sometimes it's worth it depending on what you do i mean we we use the adobe suite here and i love it it's mm -hmm. great sure but at home i use a lot of audacity I audacity no being a, it's a open source free audio editing what's called a daw or a Didi, digital audio workstation yep and uh, that's actually i use audacity as well for a lot of stuff right it's great it really is and it does nearly everything that almost any of the paid programs will do might be a little harder to navigate because again it's open source it's free yeah people have been you know adding to it over the years that's kind of the whole point of open source technology which is great because the tools are almost limitless but sometimes it's a little bit more cumbersome to find your way around but once you do it's easy there's tutorials everywhere I'm for sure this right. stuff. i mean you go to youtube and search for do blank and blank and you can find almost anything oh, so absolutely. i mean this setup we're using right now is a portable setup that comes in basically put it i put it in a little suitcase and it's a little tascam portable audio uh recorder a couple of mics a couple of tripods a few cables and suddenly you're a studio exactly exactly and really Finding a room with less ambient noise is always good, too. I mean, mm. luckily, we, we have some of the soundproofing in here. The uh, the AC above me is not blasting or anything. That's always nice. But it's kind of funny when you start first doing this. You start to really learn a lot about room tone and how every room sounds a little bit different. Even if it's completely soundproofed, it's mm. going to sound different. So you, you want to make sure that you understand where you're recording as well. You can't just take all your equipment, walk out in the middle of the street and expect to record great audio because all those cars flying by, yeah, you're not going to hear a damn thing. <laughs> That's a good point. So you know, you've worked with a variety of clients with many different expectations and approaches. What were some examples of the biggest train wrecks and what people can do to avoid them? Mm. I'm going to go back to the uh, Los Angeles days for this one. Sure. When I was doing more scripted work in Los Angeles uh, and Hollywood, so to speak. <laughs> make sure that you are working with reliable people and make sure that even though you're working with reliable people you make sure everybody knows where they need to be and when sure send out emails a week before a couple days before the night before the day of do those kind of things because it's really obnoxious when you're waiting three hours on set for your lead 
and everybody else is just getting real pissed off. They, are, they do not want to be there anymore. And then the lead just shows up willy-nilly. Hey, how's it going, everybody? And no, 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 no. You don't want that. Make sure you're working with reliable people. I, I've worked with some people who have rather big names out there. I will tell you I will never work with some of them again because they were just horrible to work with. They were not timely. They were not professional. They were not respectful. So that's that's one thing that absolutely anytime you're working on a project in collaboration with somebody else doing anything, make sure you have good, quality, reliable people on board. That uh, That can avoid most train wrecks. The other thing, double check your equipment before you go yeah and then double check it as soon as you get there make sure you have what you need make sure it's set up are your batteries charged do you have extra batteries if they're not charged do you have an extra cable if one goes the littlest things if you i'm, I'm sitting here chuckling as i hold up the extra cable right. i have sitting in front of me so and right the batter, my extra batteries over there absolutely because if you never know what's going to go wrong you have to have a backup plan for everything and it's not that difficult to do but it becomes much more difficult if you forget to do the backup plan. You get there and something goes wrong. So make sure your equipment is in good order. Day of the shoot, day before the shoot, charge all those batteries, make a checklist, go through that inventory checklist, check it off. Oh, I can't stress that enough. I have I have personally forgotten equipment on shoots before, and that's a pain. Because there's nothing worse than forgetting, you know, your nice headphones and scrounging some earbuds out of your gym bag <laughs> so that you can try to monitor. It's not it's not really going to work that well. So let's end on a positive note. What are the coolest, best, most impactful projects you've worked on and what made them great? Oh, man. Wow. I like that question. That there's, I don't know if there's one answer. I, the short film we recently made was a blast for so many reasons. I mean, first, it was a zombie film, which is great. <laughs> I I actually got to die in the movie, too. I was, among other things, the stunt supervisor on the film. And, okay. And there was just one part. When you're making an indie film and you're getting people to come do things for free, mm -hmm. you don't want them to hurt themselves. And there was just one part in there. I'm, I, I, I told the director, I said, nobody else is doing this because if somebody's going to get hurt, it it's going to be one of us. It's not going to be one of them. Got it. At all. <laughs> so <laughs> we, create, uh, create a freedom is something oh, that makes a project great. Oh, yeah. And, and this group of people that we worked with, it was just awesome. We had the best people come out for this. Just I couldn't believe some of the talent that came out to do things for free. And the whole project, the way it was thrown together, was so community-based. I mean, restaurants from nearby Natick and in Watertown when we were filming would cater our food for the day and stuff like that that's great and the vibe on the set we worked hard damn hard but it was fun mm -hmm. it was so much fun plus dying on camera is just a blast <laughs> I've, I've done it a couple of times now uh it's actually one of the other projects that one of the first projects i worked on in los angeles i had just graduated i was visiting out there looking around at places, looking for jobs. And I get a call from a friend of mine. And he says, hey, do you want to work on a 48-hour production? And I had just found a place, and I had just found a job. A few days of vacation. Sure, what the hell? <laughs> so for 48 hours straight, we, um, we made a, a short film called Michael Myers in Love for the Producers Guild Shorts competition. And it ended up being... The whole theme was Halloween because it was the year that... Uh, Oh, shoot. He passed away. Um, oh, the writer. Damn. Can't think of the name. But it was Halloween was a big deal at the time, the movies. Sure. Halloween. So yeah. they wanted it to feature, you know, Michael Myers. And we tried to do a different take on it. And it was outrageous. And, and he actually killed me. <laughs> but it was, again, it was one of those projects where you walk in. There's just shit written all over the whiteboard. You have no idea what's going on. And mm. everybody starts talking to me once. Okay, this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. And I'm just, I'm sitting there. I just walked into this room. These people are all going nuts. What is, what is going on? Oh, so this is like Michael Myers in love. 
And then the producer goes, no, no, not exactly. And then the director goes, no, no, shut up. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hell yes. You get, let's write this right now. And so then we're writing the script and then doing things in that fast of a pace. I mean, I was doing Foley sounds at 4 a.m. Sure. It was, that was a blast. And we ended up getting an honorable mention. So that was pretty cool too. As far as projects more in the commercial world, I, you know, I've, I've been pretty lucky to work on a lot of fun stuff. I really enjoyed doing the voiceovers for a lot of the companies that we represent. That part of it is always fun for me. Mm -hmm. What kind of voices but, did you do? Well, typically in advertising, it's pretty standard. A lot of it's like this. Guy next Sometimes door. Sometimes it's like this. Sometimes it's like this. But, you know, mm -hmm. depending on the tone or tone. Just tonally. Yeah. Occasionally. Very seldom. We'll get we'll get some characters in there. You know, we'll be able to talk in a southern accent a little bit. And I mean, I grew up at Bluegrass Festival, so we can we can switch into that whenever. That's easy. Well, that's fine. You can do that all the time all if right, you want. We can do that. We can go real deep south if you want. All right. We'll do that. Yeah, you can go North Carolina south. Like, it ain't really south. We, we're more north. We talk fast. Not that much of a twang, you know. It's, we, we get that kind of stuff in every now and then. Or I actually, I when I started doing freelance voiceover work, I did a couple of commercials for Australian companies, which was hilarious. Uh, because give, I, give, me, give me your best Australian. Uh, I've never been to Australia, mate, but I'll do a pretty good accent there. Apparently, that's that's what they think. You know, I'll go down to the bush and uh, hunt down some coyotes and put some shrimp on the bobby and, you know. You just gotta flatten out those A sounds, and you're good. Yeah, flatten out the A sounds. It's not, not too difficult, really. I find it a little easier than the British accent, truthfully. But that uh, that's always fun for me. I thoroughly enjoy doing that. It's always kind of funny when you're driving in the car and you hear somebody on the radio, and hey, that's me. <laughs> it's neat, you know. But otherwise, I'd I'd say I've been very lucky. And that most of the projects I have worked on have been very rewarding. And that's because I, well, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be in a place where the company I'm in is great. The projects I was doing before in the scripted world were more fun. I didn't have to put up with as much of the nonsense. Every now and then you do, but, you know, comedy sketches and stuff like that. That's all rewarding. That's all fun. So mm -hmm. I've, I've been very lucky in that regard. I can't think of a better topic to end on than that. I, I want to say thank you to Garrison Feldman here at uh, lovely Scenic Davis Advertising in Worcester, Mass. Uh, Garrison, thanks so much. It's been a, a lot of fun chatting. Thank you for coming out. I, I had a blast. This was a lot of fun, and I'm glad you got to come check out the office and hang out for a little bit. And Well, turns out you're pretty close by, so <laughs> something tells me we'll probably end up linking up at some point again. Well, that would be absolutely fantastic. Well, that is it for Speaking to Speakers, and there will be more great, interesting people coming on soon. Definitely. Thank you, Robert. Thanks for listening. Speaking to Speakers is sponsored by ITM Speakers, helping executives, sales staff, and subject matter experts become more effective and persuasive communicators. Learn more at itmspeakers.com.